So, good morning. I trust uh, everyone had a good rest and a, a nice dinner. We had an excellent uh, uh, informal session last evening with our Georgian and Israeli colleagues. Um, wealth of information that I think we can all use in a different, different ways. And uh, we'll be beginning our, our final session today. And uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Aya Lulle. She's from the uh, Latvian University and also the director of our, the U university's newly created Diaspora's Migration uh, Study and Research Center. Please, Aya. Good morning, excellences, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and, and researchers. Uh, it's my honor to chair this session, uh, one of the most interesting sessions down on earth here in Latvia uh, about the lessons that we can learn uh, with respect to the um, return migration. And our first speaker is uh, Dr. Inta Mierinja. And Inta currently is one of the most productive social, sci uh, social science researcher in, in Latvia and working with a large scale, the biggest uh, migration, return migration, and diaspora research in Latvia ever taken in Latvia. Inta is the principal investigator of this research. I also want to mention that Inta received the, the, the prize uh, of science from the University of Latvia last year, uh, which was in the honor of her innovative leadership of this project. And, um, Inta will address several P's in her presentation uh, with respect to return migration policies, percep perceptions, problems, perspectives. Floor is yours. Um, thank you, Aya. Um, hello, everyone. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, and to be talking about a uh, recent survey of ours uh, that was just uh, conducted at the end of last year, uh, which I hope, um, uh, which I think links nicely to, this, to the topic of this conference. And, uh, and, um, and I'm also excited to be participating in this and also listening to the others, other presentations and, and to, to what is happening and, and the research that's been doing and uh, that's, that's been taking place in the other countries as well. So I think it's a really uh, uh, fruitful dis uh, uh, discussion. Um, so the topic uh, uh, that I want to explore today is the return migration to Latvia, uh, problems, policies, perceptions and, pers um, and uh, perspectives. Um, uh, the data is, um, um, uh, and well, first of all, what has brought us to this, uh, to this uh, study? Um, as we know, the Latvian diaspora abroad is growing. Um, the emigration rates have increased rapidly during the latest uh, economic crisis. Uh, and just uh, during the last 10 years, uh, more than 220,000 people have left uh, Latvia to some other country. Um, uh, we also know that more and more people uh, choose to move abroad with all their families and plan to stay there permanently. Um, and if you look at the public discourse, it's very clear that in Latvia, immigration uh, is primarily seen as a loss of human capital, uh, especially because these are usually young people who leave, these are usually educated people uh, who choose to leave, and uh, it is a, a threat uh, in the situation of a rapidly aging society. Um, uh, at, at the policy level, uh, there has been an increasing attention uh, to those living abroad, uh, which has resulted in the development of uh, several policy documents uh, that address uh, the problems at different levels. Uh, well, first of all, um, um, these policies look at, at potential return migrants, um, uh, meaning that um, um, they look at poss possibilities to foster and return migration, uh, second, these are actual return migrants, uh, meaning that these policies are also, some of the policies are also aimed at um, helping them to reintegrate back into the society. Um, and I'll talk about this a little later. Uh, and finally, uh, the diaspora in general. 
uh, because what we know from the surveys and what, is, um, what has become increasingly clear is that uh, many of the, of the people who have emigrated will not return. Uh, but it does not mean that they are lost to Latvia. It means that there are new possibilities, there are new opportunities to develop cooperation, to develop business networks, to develop uh, cooperation in education, culture, science, etc. Uh, so uh, some of the policies have been addressing these uh, possibilities and trying to make the best of them. Um, as of the questions that we'll be looking at, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to talk about what has been the role of these policies. Uh, second, uh, do the plans, actions and services uh, correspond to the needs and expectations uh, of the target audience? Uh, and finally, uh, um, uh, can we say from, um, from, uh, from the interviews uh, and from the survey, uh, are there any, any other actions that are appreciated and that are expected uh, by the target group? Um, the data that we use comes from the recent uh, European Social Fund uh, project. Um, the Immigrant Communities of Latvia, National Identity, Transnational Relations and Diaspora Politics. Uh, that is a, um, a half a million project uh, which, uh, uh, which started at the beginning last year and will end uh, in August this year. <laughs> Um, um, we are a team of 11 independent researchers and experts um, and, and during this project we're studying the process of emigration from very different points of view. We're looking at um, return migration, at, uh, at, um, at uh, maintaining identity and language abroad, at the um, uh, situation of children and at um, uh, celebration of, of national festivities and many other things. Um, uh, overall, during the course of this uh, study, uh, we have conducted almost uh, 200 in-depth interviews uh, with immigrants uh, abroad, uh, uh, as well as with return migrants, uh, and expert interviews here uh, in Latvia, uh, experts in diaspora policy and return migration. Um, and this, uh, um, as part of the project, um, um, we also conducted a large-scale quantitative study uh, um, conducting 14,011 uh, interviews with immigrants um, at the age of 15 plus in 111 countries. And here we really, really have to say a big thank you to all the supporters who supported us and to all the people who took, uh, took, place and uh, who, who took part and participated uh, in, in, in this, uh, this, uh, this survey. Um, uh, and uh, we obviously also uh, employ other methods such as focus group discussions, participant observations and other uh, methods. Uh, but I won't go into methodological details because you can, you can read about it more uh, on our website. Um, the structure of the, of the presentation is, first of all, I'll be talking about problems, um, the difficulties that the diaspora uh, is facing, and the policies um, that are addressing these problems, uh, perspectives and uh, perceptions of these uh, policies. So first of all, um, uh, talking about the situation um, uh, in the diaspora, and first of all, how many of them plan to return. Um, if you look at those who emigrated um, from 2000, uh, from year 2000 or later, uh, which is the most recent wave of emigration, um, we see that um, um, uh, only 4% um, know that they plan to return uh, within the next six months. Uh, uh, 20 more percent, uh, uh, 12 more percent, uh, say that they will return, that they plan to return within the next five years. So in total, if we count them together, this, uh, this is about 16 percent uh, who plan to return um, uh, within the course of, uh, of the next five years. Um, um, as we see, there's also a group that plans to return in old age, uh, but there's a large, large group who say that they, they might return possibly if the situation changes. Um, so, the way we can look at this data is that, um, is that um, uh, it, uh, it's a big opportunity also uh, it's, um, to, uh, um, to, to encourage these people who are still thinking and considering if they should come back or not, um, uh, to uh, try to persuade them and to show them that there are possibilities and opportunities also in Latvia, um, um, and it's, it's probably worth considering also returning home. Uh, on, on the other hand, there's about 30, almost 30% who said that they will never, retur never return to Latvia. Right. Uh, if you look at the literature, uh, there are uh, several, uh, um, several uh, theoretical models developed trying to explain why do people come back. Uh, and first of all, the neoclassical economics talk about uh, return migration as a result of unsuccessful experiences, meaning that uh, people probably didn't find uh, what they were searching for, they didn't find a job, they couldn't really... Uh, get what they expected uh, to get. 
Uh, the, second, uh, the second possible model is the uh, economics of, new economics of labor migration, which mostly talks about uh, return migration as a success story, and it can be either conservative um, success story in the sense that they return because they have achieved uh, uh, their goals, they have fulfilled uh, their, uh, their dreams and their aspirations, what they were hoping for when they left. Uh, and second is the innovative, when they come back uh, with a goal of starting their own business, of, um, um, of uh, uh, doing something uh, interesting in their home country, uh, maybe as entrepreneurs uh, or self-employed. Uh, and, and the last one is the structural approach, um, um, which talks about returning uh, due to inability to integrate in some problems with discrimination, with uh, um, um, with not feeling, not, not feeling like they belong and things like that. Uh, and finally, returning an old age, uh, which is also, as we saw in the previous graph, not as uncommon. Um, in case of Latvia, what the survey shows is that the main reasons for returning are, are always non-economic, which is more in line with the structural model. Um, uh, the first and main reason why people consider coming back to Latvia is the family and friends. Uh, which is a very important reason for almost half uh, of uh, the Latvian uh, migrants who left uh, in 2000 or later. As the second most important reason is that I miss Latvia, which is the uh, nostalgic feelings of, um, of the Latvian nature, of the Latvian food, of running barefooted in, uh, on the beach or, uh, or, or, or having a walk in, in, uh, in the forest. So these are the intangible things that, that people miss and that brings uh, that, 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 that uh, that, that uh, brings them home sometimes. Um, uh, the third most important is the Latvian language, uh, the, um, the possibility to live uh, in one's own uh, familiar language environment, to speak their own language, uh, which is important for 18%. Uh, but there are also some other reasons uh, that are mentioned also uh, in the survey as well as in the qualitative interviews, uh, which is that they don't want to live as strangers, outsiders, some sort of lower class, um, but here I have to say that actually Latvian immigrants, they integrate quite well um, uh, in, in, in the other countries' societies. Uh, nevertheless, there is the sense that uh, as well as you integrate, you will never really be a true British or a true, uh, I don't know, Belgium, uh, because you are still different, you've raised with different movies, with different culture. So this uh, being among uh, people like themselves, it is again an important factor of what brings people home. Um, uh, another reason is that people overcame their financial difficulties, um, uh, fulfilled their aims, um, uh, which is um, what sometimes brings them home, uh, and also that they want to develop some new business ideas. Um, finally, uh, what the interviews show is that um, sometimes when people leave abroad, uh, they have high expectations, and when they face the reality, they realize that actually uh, maybe it's not, the gains are not significant enough, enough for them to stay there. Uh, for example, even though if they earn more, uh, the costs of living are also higher, um, and also uh, they have to bear the cost of not being able to meet their family uh, as frequently, uh, of not being in their own language environment and other things. So uh, after, after actually living there for some time, people start to re-evaluate their values, what is really that they want in their lives. Uh, and then sometimes they come to a conclusion that, you know, maybe it's still worth uh, coming back home, even though the salaries may be lower and there's some other problems, but they're still home. And finally, it's a concern for children, because uh, what we saw in the interviews with, um, uh, with migrants is that uh, children tend to assimilate really, really quickly. Uh, and that is a concern for parents because they often did not expect this process to take place so quickly. Um, and they suddenly start speaking English, they suddenly start, uh, um, sometimes it's, it's uh, also there's this perception sometimes the Latvian education system is better uh, and uh, they also want to, uh, immigrants want to have their, their children to have an opportunity to interact with their grandparents more often, to interact with their family, not to take away their identity um, and so on. So this is a, a big concern why some people return. On the other hand, uh, if we talk about what prevents people from returning, uh, these are mostly, usually economic factors. Um, first of all, the lack of a decent job offer or opportunities for growth um, uh, as the main factor uh, why people uh, uh, do not return. Um, what is interesting is that if you, uh, uh, those people who have mentioned uh, this, this factor, this decent job offer, 
um, when we asked them what would be uh, the uh, what would be the salary that would make you consider uh, returning to Latvia, about a half of them mentioned 1,000 euro, uh, which does not seem to be such an unachievable goal. Well, at the moment, obviously, the minimum wage is only uh, 320 uh, euro, so. Um, it's not much, but on the other hand, if we think in the perspective of 15, 20 years, um, uh, it's not as unrealistic and not as unachievable. Um, uh, what is problematic, really, with finding a decent job is that um, uh, in Latvia, still contacts matter a lot for finding a job, um, which we find in the interviews. Uh, so, for immigrants, uh, if they have lost, uh, if, they, if, if these ties with Latvia have broken down, if they don't have as many contacts anymore, uh, uh, with potential employers, uh, then that is obviously a disadvantage and, and that makes it harder for them to find a job in Latvia because they're disadvantaged as compared to the locals. Um, there's also a big factor in stability and weak social guarantees. So it's clear that if these factors would improve, uh, that would be um, a big motivation uh, for um, people to, to consider returning back home. Um, uh, there's also a problem of lack of a home where to return to. Uh, uh, meaning that um, uh, currently only a half, uh, according to the survey, have a dwelling in Latvia, a home or apartment, uh, and only a few municipalities offer help with that. So that is a potential um, area of development. Um, another big issue is finding a place for children in a kindergarten or in a school, uh, because uh, very often in Latvia, if you haven't brought your child to uh, if you haven't, haven't uh, um, uh, been to a kindergarten the first day, basically the second day when the child is born, then you can't really uh, the count on finding uh, a place in the state kindergarten uh, uh, um, anymore. Uh, so it is a problem for immigrants if they, if they suddenly come home and their child has not been registered to kindergarten. It's, it's very difficult to, to get them in. Also, with schools, uh, sometimes uh, the children, uh, they don't speak Latvian as well. Uh, and they need specific help. Um, um, uh, so it's, it's, it's also a problem uh, that they consider. Um, and finally, obviously, there's lack of belief in a positive and stable development of the country. Um, right. Um, uh, talking about institutional barriers, um, uh, the potential migrants are concerned about different issues. Well, first of all, is the issue of benefits and pensions and how they're calculated and uh, if a person has lived abroad. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of um, lack of information, and, and, and as the survey shows, people sometimes struggle to find it. 12% uh, of the ASPRO members have tried to find some information returning, um, related to possible returning, but have failed to, uh, uh, to find it. And specifically, uh, most often that's information about a, actually also about job offers, uh, but also about social protection and social guarantees, about taxes, uh, as well as about housing and education. So these are the uh, uh, problematic issues. Right, um, so return migrants overall, they're very different. Um, and what, what unites them, if you look at data, well, first of all, a good sign is that uh, most of them are retaining their Latvian citizenship, uh, which, which uh, puts them on a good ground for, to, you know, for, uh, for reintegrating back. Um, also, those who return, they often have close ties with Latvia, emotional ties and also physical ties. And uh, they also um, feel strongly attached to Latvia and have lived abroad relatively short period of time. So these are the factors, having the close ties in Latvia, having some sort of um, uh, um, relationship to Latvia uh, that is important in order for people to return and also that helps them to reintegrate, uh, which speaks in favor of uh, trying to facilitate uh, uh, um, uh, also some um, uh, retaining some, some, some uh, some cultural, um, for example, to organizing some cultural events uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to help people to maintain they, their national identity abroad as well, because that is an important factor that might help, um, uh, facilitate the integration back into society. Talking about policy, the main policy documents um, in Latvia to deal with uh, return migrants and with the diaspora uh, are the plan for immigration support activities and the action plan for cooperation with the Latvian diaspora. So these are the main uh, policy documents. Uh, what is also uh, important is that um, uh, even, in, even in the national development plan of Latvia, um, um, it is stated that one of the, the mid-term goals of Latvia is to reduce immigration and foster return migration of Latvian nationals abroad. In 2013, under the auspices of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 
uh, in cooperation with the Ministry of Culture, a diaspora working group was established, bringing together uh, specialists and experts from different ministries, from different agencies uh, and institutions, uh, and thus um, uh, developing in a more inter interinstitutional manner uh, the policies and the different aspects that are important for the diaspora. Um, the plan for re-immigration re support activities, um, it's mainly aimed at offering practical help to those Latvian nationals and their family members um, who are abroad and consider the possibility to return or have returned uh, to Latvia. Um, so it's, um, it's more aimed at providing them some practical help, information and, and, and some support with uh, uh, in integrating children in the school system, etc. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and it also defines specific target groups that it's uh, focusing on. There's professionals, mostly professionals, young people, students, um, um, and families with children. Um, there are different, there are different um, activities, including in uh, the plan for re-immigration. One is development of a one-stop agency. Uh, well, I think I won't go into much detail because I don't have much, uh, that much time anymore, but um, I would just like to emphasize the main areas uh, that this uh, plan is aimed at. One is the development of a one-stop agency. Uh, the other the, is the availability, uh, um, which means that people should be able to find all the information they need uh, in one place. Um, uh, the other is the availability of labor market information, as we saw that is also an important aspect. Uh, this is mostly um, uh, currently done by the Public Employment Services and um, offer this help and it's uh, actually this kind of help is getting increasingly more popular um, among the target group. Uh, um, uh, already highly qualified, um, uh, attracting highly qualified return migrants. Um, uh, for example, writing off some st student loans in certain areas that, the, uh, uh, that are important. Um, Um, uh, yeah. uh, um, um, support for improving Latvian language skills, uh, promoting cooperation with the diaspora, um, in, in exploring also the potential of, of, of the diaspora and cooperation, support for pupils who return and integrate into the Latvian school system, uh, also, for example, the um, uh, possibility to, uh, when the government, uh, public administration, uh, local government institutions are selecting employees so that they, uh, they, they, they allow interviews via Skype, which would help them. Uh, and also the extension of people who can apply for re re repatriation status. Um, uh, um, the action plan for cooperation with the Latvian diaspora uh, it also includes a lot of activities, more than 50 different activities into four lines of fact actions. The Latvian identity met maintaining links with Latvia, promoting civic and political involvement involvement of diaspora, uh, collaboration with the diaspora in the economy, culture and education, support for those who wish to return. And just maybe if I have one more minute, um, uh, what are the perceptions of the re-immigration plan? Well, the re-immigration plan, unfortunately, is not that well known in the target group. Uh, actually, the majority have not heard about it, and only 10% know what exactly the plan envisions. Um, uh, the target group wrongly perceives this plan as aimed at fostering return migration, uh, which is one of the reasons why uh, this plan is not that well perceived. Um, they're skeptical of the impact of the plan. Um, um, and, and some of them think that, well, first of all, one needs to focus on improving the socioeconomic conditions here in Latvia, and then the re -immigration would, uh, return migration would happen naturally. Um, um, and also, um, uh, but on the other hand, there are also some positive aspe aspects. Um, uh, first of all, it symbolically the existence of such a plan symbolically demonstrates that the, that the government cares about, my, uh, about uh, uh, the diaspora, uh, the Latvian, uh, Lat um, the, the, um, the nationals living abroad. And on the other hand, um, we also see from the interviews that actually the, the intended activities fit the needs of the target group, especially with regards to support for pupils, access to information, improving language skills, and student debt relief. So overall, these activities uh, that are intended are, are positively evaluated by the diaspora. Um, and um, uh, talking about um, uh, uh, challenges, uh, just one last thing I wanted to say is that um, if you look at who are those who plan to return, um, and here you see in the graph that actually um, those who plan to return are uh, uh, more likely to uh, plan returning are people with a lower level of education, and if you look at uh, uh, which, which, which areas these are, these are, um, uh, these are for example, uh, um, those who have education in agriculture, and, and there's a there's a very, very small percentage of those who have acquired education in medicine and health services 
who plan to return. So uh, there are some problematic areas uh, uh, where, um, uh, where um, uh, basically uh, um, uh, that, 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 due to, um, that immigration has left very problematic in Latvia and that, that are difficult to fill in with specialists such as, for example, medicine and health services. And also, those who do, have, do not have children are more likely to return rather than those who do have children. So the, the current cha challenges now uh, is that obviously, um, um, even though migration opens up a lot of opportunities, uh, it, has, uh, pr um, it has allowed uh, a lot of people to avoid poverty and, uh, and unemployment during the times of crisis. And obviously, the unemployment rates would have been higher if not for immigration during the recent crisis. Um, uh, and we know from the survey that people abroad are actually happier, uh, they, 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 they say that they're happy, and they say that they're happier than they used to be in Latvia. Uh, they gain new skills, and there's obviously a lot of potential to bring these skills back home if they decide to return. On the other hand, um, uh, there is a huge loss of human capital, and, and specifically Latvia is struggling with attracting back those who would, benefit, would benefit the country most, that is, uh, people who are highly qualified and, and younger people. Um, and, and, and as we see, we are, um, uh, those who emigrate are usually really the younger people that could form the future for the Latvia. So these are the big challenges that the Latvia is currently facing. And the policy documents have been addressing these, uh, and they definitely need to be de developed further. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for this very rich presentation and I hope we still will have some time for discussion at the end so you can ask the questions. But we really have to move ahead. And our next speaker is Mr. Pierre-Yves Le Bon, a member of the French uh, National Assembly and also a rapporteur for the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. And he will address uh, and will provide insights into educational and cultural networks of communities living abroad. And for a change, we will avoid the PowerPoint and we will enjoy the speech. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting me here in Riga. I'm truly touched and honored to be with you, uh, and especially as I can speak from both heart and experience, as I am a diaspora member myself. I've lived abroad, away from France, for 27 years, more than 20 years working in industry, and the last three years representing my compatriots in the French Parliament. Uh, we have, we French people, very often complicated in organizations divided the world in 11 constituencies and I represent people living in Central Eastern Europe and also in the Balkan countries in the National Assembly. Interested into issues pertaining to free movement of people, obviously I had to join the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, which I did, and I now work uh, in the Committee of Cultural Science, Education and the Media uh, for the preparation of a report on educational cultural networks of communities living abroad. There has been a lot of work already in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe done by the Committee on Migration, Refugees, Displaced People in relation to diasporas. Uh, that work has underlined the need for greater political participation of migrants as a way to increase their capacity to promote and to transfer democratic values and that work has also recommended to member states to elaborate migration policies promoting an institutional role for diasporas. What I'm trying to do in addition to that from the culture committee is to complement uh, that work uh, from a cultural perspective with two core questions. How can cultural networks of European diaspora help people enjoy, preserve, and transmit their culture. In other words, build up a sense of community. And the second core question is to assist the integration of migrants into the society of their country of residence. In other words, promoting inclusion, involvement in public and social life, and democratic citizenship. So there are two main aspects in the work that I'm currently conducting. 
One is identification and the other one is integration. Maybe I should start with a few words on the concept of diaspora. Diasporas are very generally dispersed, diffuse, and represented and largely, unfortunately, largely invisible. That term covers all people who maintain some form of attachment to a specific country of origin in, their, in relation to their migration background. It includes several generations of migrants, some with the citizenship of the country of residence, others with multiple nationalities. The role of diaspora is critical to living together in Europe, and that role in building up a sense of community and bridging different cultures is not sufficiently understood nor recognized at this stage. It is truly becoming an urgent political priority in Europe as tensions and insecurity grow in society, deepening the divide between communities. As a consequence, important choices are ahead of us, whether to strengthen integration and national identity or whether to build social cohesion on the basis of cultural diversity and positive interaction. Cultural diversity is an inevitable social reality, but the question remains how to treat it positively. That has been already the topic of a debate we had in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe a year ago through a report prepared by my Portuguese colleague, Carlos Costa Neves. In this context, I believe that associations and the voluntary sector diaspora organizations at large provide a link to the culture of origin. It creates platform for support, solidarity, mutual assistance and interaction. And it also nurture multilingualism and plural identities. Policies are needed to build that set of synergies in the sense that country of residencies should open up a dialogue with diaspora communities. They should help young migrants of the second or third generation build a positive multicultural identity. They should develop systematic policies and partnerships with diaspora organizations. Countries of origin could largely benefit from stronger ties with expatriates communities, contributing with investments, transfer of knowledge, new cultural models and skills to social economic development, but also to establish cultural, economic and political links with other countries. My current research focuses on the educational and cultural networks of communities abroad in that very context. It analyzes and evaluates forms of support and partnership between public authorities and diasporas. By taking both perspectives into account by reaching out to diaspora organizations and communities and contacting national and local authorities in the countries of residence. But also by creating a basis for a common policy on European diasporas at the level of the Council of Europe and hopefully the level of the European Union. I'm, I've been studying uh, diaspora organizations with my team and people uh, at the Council of Europe and I want to acknowledge at this point the very precious support of Europeans throughout the world, uh, saluting some of their members uh, here in, in the room. I've been in contact with over 35 social, political and cultural diaspora organizations, associations, religious communities, and Saturday schools representing diasporas from 17 European countries. In order to work with them, uh, I've developed a questionnaire with seven open uh, questions covering, uh, in a nutshell, links of the organization with other organizations, with the country of residence and the country of origin, covering activities and projects of these organizations, especially regarding their role in integration and identification, and covering also expectations, ex their suggestions to improve cooperation on the local, national, and European level. To date, my results are as follows. Mostly cultural and, as and social associations have contributed uh, thus far. They offer various activities and, and services, including activities that create a platform for exchange and networking, 
celebration of traditional festivals and public holidays, film, dance, music festivals, regularly organizing meetings. Uh, many events, many of those events are open to members of the local society, creating meeting places, cultural bridges, and demonstrating the added value of diasporas and migration. The second element that I've seen emerge uh, in these questionnaires is all around educational activities for language tuition, courses in cultural history, customs, tradition, summer schools or summer camps in the country of origin, and exchanges. And that addresses the second and third generation of migrants in particular, keeping them from losing ties with their, with their parents or grandparents country of origin. I could quote uh, the Association of German Saturday Schools in the UK that offers bilingual or national children which are much less exposed to German and would lose their skills and languages without special tuition. I could say the same about my, my home country friends that came up with a program called Français Langue Maternelle, FLAM, that offers also Saturday schools for kids that do not go to a school uh, that would offer uh, French classes. Another element of the results that I've covered uh, to date is counseling and assistance. There is a whole lot in terms of information transfer, support for recently arrived migrants, legal advice, translation, workshops, and seminars facilitating adaptation to the new society. It serves at a first point of contact these activities of counseling and assistance are easier uh, to reach out to than embassies and consulates most of the times. And there is a special focus on distrib uh, distributing information. Many organizations regularly send out newsletters, maintain very detailed websites, and some publish even newspapers and magazines and other publications. It does create a very positive by our multicultural identity by establishing a close social link to the country of residence without losing the connection to the country of origin. Some of these organizations also pursue political objectives, especially umbrella organizations, which either represent a specific diaspora community in the country of residence, fostering participation and reinforcing the voice of migrants in national debates they are generally accepted and supported by the country of residence. Or some organizations represent diaspora citizens in their country of origin, mainly pursuing lobbying activities. And as such, they are in close direct contacts with national parliaments and the respective government. That is particularly true in Nordic countries. And they often receive subsidies from these governments. You could also find smaller organizations acting at the local level, grassroots level, uh, which usually maintain less intensive links with authorities and are less visible and rarely receive uh, any funding. Issues regarding funding and recognition uh, were described as high uh, by uh, people that responded to the questionnaire. Uh, the majority of associations that responded to the questionnaire said that they are dissatisfied with their financial situations. Uh, if they receive funding, it is usually project-based, requiring a complicated and time-consuming application. There is no means for them to plan ahead nor to establish any sustainable structure. That is partly due to the general lack of funding also. And you find associations complaining that way too much work depends on volunteers. Often one to two volunteers take an initiative, acting as leaders and reliable representatives of the diaspora communities, but if the, those leading volunteers withdraw or reduce activities, then projects stop and efforts quickly diminish. Associations, as a consequence, describe themselves as not institutionalized enough to maintain themselves. And that is a, a key issue uh, looking at the future. How could we improve policies regarding European diasporas? A great majority of associations that we have spoken to uh, to date wish to reinforce cooperation among associations in the same and in different countries of residence as well as between states at European level. Suggestions, suggestions provided by associations are first of all to create platforms 
for exchange, largely promoting the concept of cooperation networks to share experience and best practices through the direct exchange and meetings regularly organized at national and European level, but also through informal contacts based on easily accessible materials that could be collected, administered, and distributed either by EU institutions or by Council of Europe institutions, stressing the particular importance of online platforms which, is, which are easy to access and cost-effective. The second level of suggestions that was made is to reinforce the political representation of diaspora communities, in the sense that the concept of diaspora and expatriate should be fully integrated in European policies, which should be mutualized regarding welfare, foreign policy, language policy. They want to strengthen their situation status by appointing central authorities for diaspora communities on the national and European level, by introducing a certain number of seats for MPs representing diaspora communities into all national parliaments, and reserving a certain percentage of European funds for diaspora communities, making them more visible and more easily accessible. This is to describe in a nutshell, because I see that I have two minutes left, what we have done uh, to date. What I want to say uh, as a conclusion is that I'm halfway through uh, the process of, of drafting this report. Uh, definitely, I need to build up on your experience. Any feedback I could get from organizations or individuals will be very appreciated in preparing this report. Uh, the second stage of the report for me will be to focus on eight, nine countries which provide uh, significant experience. Uh, to quote some of these countries, and the list is not closed, uh, Portugal is one, uh, Italy, Croatia, Turkey, Latvia, uh, Albania, uh, one out of Scandinavian countries, maybe Sweden. Uh, I was uh, hoping I could work with Russia, but given the difficulties in the parliamentary assembly, that is very uh, improbable. Uh, I want to build uh, on, on the network uh, that we could create along with my team for drafting this report. So feel free to reach out uh, to me in the course of the day and also through email. Uh, I'm going to be taking also two or three trips uh, to some of the countries uh, to study in situ uh, the situation and I hope to be able to present the report to the Parliamentary Assembly uh, in plenary uh, in the second half of next year with a view of securing a two-third majority, meaning that I could, along with the Parliamentary Assembly, uh, make some uh, useful recommendations to the Committee of Ministers and use that report to set a framework uh, to promote migration and to promote diaspora organizations at European level and hopefully even beyond Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation and very, very useful and important invitation for the diaspora organizations. And our next speaker is from our neighboring country, uh, from Lithuania, uh, Ginte Damoshis, uh, and she represents um, the Department of the Lithuanians Living Abroad uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Lithuania. We have a lot to learn from Lithuania. First of all, allow me to congratulate the Latvian EU presidency and the Latvian government for this initiative. We're very pleased to be able to share uh, the Lithuanian experience in working with the diaspora communities around the world. And in fact, um, I'll be uh, describing a program that was adopted in Lithuania uh, back in 2011. Uh, we realistically started implementing it in 2012. So it's a relatively young uh, program called Global Lithuania. And once uh, the consultation process uh, with the diaspora uh, was, was begun and, and concluded, uh, we were forced to deal with um, the opinions of, of critics who perhaps misinterpreted the, the purposes of this program. For instance, the anti-globalists accused the program of actually promoting emigration. Other critics 
uh, uh, thought that per perhaps not enough attention was being paid to um, stopgap measures for, for emigration. Uh, not enough uh, was, was being done to actually promote the return of uh, immigrants. So what I would like to do is actually um, put into focus uh, the primary goal of this Global Lithuania program, which is a program of engagement with the diaspora. Uh, previous colleague mentioned a platform of support. Uh, uh, most definitely, that is one of the goals of the, the, the program. Also, it helps to identify new communities that are being formed um, in countries uh, of uh, immigration destination and first and foremost, ensuring that the diaspora keeps in contact and strengthens its, its ties with the home country. So in a nutshell, the Global Lithuania program goals are to help the diaspora maintain Lithuanian identity, uh, to uh, include them in the promotion of Lithuania abroad. Uh, they do this by uh, strengthening bilateral trades through trade, uh, of, you know, tourism, other uh, cooperative efforts. Uh, they help uh, make global opportunities for Lithuania living abroad. And uh, no doubt, one of the other goals is to encourage the return of um, emigrants and also to encourage that uh, the diaspora shares its contacts, knowledge, and expertise with the home country. So it is not a magic hat to solve all issues associated with the diaspora. It's a platform of, of cooperation, and it helps to connect uh, Lithuanians living abroad with, with Lithuanian institutions uh, and other partners in the country. Uh, recently, our statistics department, which is one of the implementing agencies of the Global Lithuania program, um, collected data around the world about uh, uh, Lithuanians uh, living abroad. Uh, here you can see the official statistics, which may be a bit on the conservative side, but nonetheless they give a realistic pe picture of how many people have emigrated. I draw your attention to the right-hand col column, uh, according to official st statistics, between 2001 and 2014, we estimate 547. Uh, 547,000 uh, Lithuanians have emigrated, and as you can see, the countries of destination are, are mainly in the EU. The other information is useful for us as the coordinating agency of the, the Global Lithuania Program. It's useful for planning our program activities, uh, services, and consultations. Uh, according to uh, unofficial so sources, uh, there's an estimated 1.3 uh, million, uh, not just Lithuanian citizens, but uh, people who associate themselves with, with Lithuania. They may be second, third uh, generation uh, Lithuanians living ab abroad and have an emotional tie or identify themselves with Lithuania. Uh, one of the misperceptions we're still uh, forced to deal with in Lithuania is that often emigration is perceived as a, as a threat and not as an opportunity. Um, this global Lithuania program seeks to address uh, emigration, which we realize is a challenge, but also we try and bring home the message that the diaspora is a national asset and that the potential of the diaspora ab abroad needs to be tapped in a better way. Uh, in other words, the, the main message is how can the state and the diaspora mutually help one another? And uh, one of the main messages uh, that our foreign minister uh, repeats during his visits abroad, and uh, he c considers work with the diaspora, one of his priorities is uh, that no matter where you reside, you can maintain ties with the country, you can contribute to Lithuania's progress and, and promote Lithuania abroad. So I emphasize that this is a policy instrument for, for engaging and working with the diaspora. Um, it doesn't regulate uh, domestic policies uh, associated with my migration in the labor market, but it seeks to, to engage uh, Lithuanians living uh, abroad. 
Now, some of the lessons we've learned with this rather young uh, diaspora policy is that we need to be flexible. And the Global Lithuania program is, um, it was adopted from 2011 to 2019, but there is an interagency action plan which is updated annually. So we're able to actually adapt to, to, to the needs of uh, the, the diaspora. And as I mentioned, the foreign ministry is a coordinating agency. We also implement the program, but there's 13 other government institutions and state agencies that participate in implementing this interagency uh, action plan. Uh, and I think that decentralized approach is actually a plus when it comes to working with, with the diaspora because number one, um, diaspora questions are integrated into the uh, works of, of these government agencies and the agencies themselves have a sense of ownership in, in their work with the diaspora uh, communities. Uh, what we found is, is also important is that there needs to be good coordination uh, among the government institutions because um, the, the budgeting for, for this program comes from the internal budgetary resources of each agency. There is no separate government funding. Each agency allocates its own uh, budgetary resources and ensures uh, implementation. Also, uh, it's very important that um, the implementers engage and cooperate with all the, the organizations um, um, that uh, work with the diaspora. We have uh, active engagement with uh, not only uh, uh, public partners, public sector partners, but with, with the, the private sector and NGO uh, partners, both in Lithuania and uh, abroad. Uh, obviously, political support is strong for this uh, program and that needs to be maintained. And uh, one of the, the, the goals uh, of, the, of the program is to maintain long-term uh, effective communications with the diaspora and make sure that, those co co that com communication goes two, two ways. Communication and uh, inclusive participation is something that makes the, the, the program work much more effectively. Here you, you see a schematic of some of the government ministries that are involved in implementing the program. Um, the target audiences are professionals and entrepreneurs, uh, Lithuanian communities and organizations that are sprouting up uh, around the world uh, in, in the, the countries of uh, destination. And we also place a focus, a special focus on, on working with youth. Um, in terms of implementing partners for the foreign ministry, obviously our network of diplomatic missions are our main instrument for reaching out to, to the diaspora, uh, Lithuanian communities abroad. Um, later on in the presentation, I'll mention the umbrella organization for both the community and youth that serves as, as an instrument for, for engaging with uh, communities around the globe, and obviously non-governmental organizations and partner institutions in, in Lithuania. Uh, also, we make a point of uh, encouraging all these partners uh, to diverse, diversify funding uh, sources for, for their activities, because this in itself prom promotes cooperation and I would say an expansion of those uh, partnerships and cooperative efforts. Some of our, uh, impossible to mention all of the initiatives that the, the, the government supports under this program and not necessarily is limited to this program. There's ongoing basic services that are provided by uh, government agencies that uh, fulfill the, the goals of uh, Global Lithuania, but uh, some of the more um, important activities that uh, the, the government sponsors or organizes 
uh, independently or in partnership with uh, non-governmental partners include the, the annual World Lithuanian Economic Forum, which is uh, geared towards the, the business community abroad and in Lith Lithuania, and just in, uh, disseminate, disseminating information about Lithuania on topics of, of specific interest from um, the investment climate to, to trade, tourism, cultural events, uh, Ministry of Education plays an important role in Lithuanian language uh, education and study opportunities. We focus on foreign and diaspora affairs. National Radio TV has become very much uh, involved in preparing uh, TV programs about Lithuanian uh, diaspora life uh, abroad. And now it's become completely routine for senior uh, government officials to meet with uh, communities abroad during their bilateral uh, visits, which I think is, is a very good sign. Uh, some of our uh, more important uh, partners include Global Lithuanian Leaders, which is a, a great uh, group that promotes networking among uh, diaspora uh, professionals. Um, they also uh, oversee a mentoring program for young professionals living abroad called LT Big Brothers, so we're very proud to be one of the sponsors of, of this program. They also uh, organize uh, each year Global Lithuanian uh, Awards, which, which recognizes the achievements of um, Lithuanian professionals across a wide range of uh, specialties. Uh, this is hosted by the, the president of, of Lithuania in the presidential palace. It gets a lot of attention uh, every year uh, on Lithuanian TV and, and radio and is also live streamed, um, um, the, the, the ceremony itself. Um, here I've also mentioned some, some of the other partners that, that are involved in, in, in just encouraging uh, partnerships between uh, you know, Lithuanian organizations or even cities and towns with um, you know, their uh, former uh, residents living abroad, um, workshops of uh, artists, Lithuanian and international uh, artists with, with Lithuanian roots, uh, music festivals, film, film festivals, all of this actively engages the, the diaspora and encourages them to, to visit Lithuania. And, uh, in many cases, ultimately to return. We ourselves try and play an active role in presenting a very positive uh, inf um, image of uh, communities abroad. Uh, for, for a while, there, were, uh, sort of, there was negative reporting about emigrant communities uh, through our Facebook page called Global Lithuania Network. We've been able to uh, share success stories in addition to uh, you know, publishing all sorts of announcements that are of interest to the diaspora community. I mentioned, I'll just go quickly through uh, some of our partners. I mentioned the Lithuanian world community. Through these communities, uh, we, we fund uh, close to 200 uh, projects, small-scale projects uh, a year that uh, either promote Lithuania or, or Lithuanian identity, culture, tourism. Uh, investment opportunities, and we've set up uh, an institutional framework for engaging uh, these umbrella uh, organizations in, in Lithuania through a joint parliamentary commission with representatives of this organization and also um, a, a commission uh, chaired by the, the prime minister, which engages twice a year um, with uh, leaders of this organization as well. I mentioned youth, um, there's strong support for Lithuanian language education, close to 200 schools abroad. Uh, we, we provide uh, funding assistance, training for, for Lithuanian language teachers, uh, seminars that are held in, in Lithuania, and all sorts of internship and mentoring programs. I'll single out one, uh, Create for Lithuania. Um, there is a very heavy competition abroad to get into this program. It allows 60 young uh, junior professionals a year uh, to be placed in public sector jobs in uh, Lithuanian government institutions. And uh, a lot of them choose then to re relocate to, to Lithuania after this experience. 
And I already mentioned some of the, the project activities that um, the implementing agencies um, uh, conduct. Uh, uh, maybe I'll just jump on to, to the next slide. I wanted to draw attention to you know, some of the services that are provided to retur returning uh, migrants, but this is uh, done outside of the Global Lithuania program. And this is an area that has received a, a lot of attention and new measures being put into place through migration policy guidelines that were recently adopted by the government. And uh, uh, this month, uh, a one-stop uh, non-governmental source of information for returning uh, migrants will be established uh, called the Migration Information Center, which will offer consultations to returning migrants and their family uh, members. So it will be an advisory group of uh, governmental business and uh, non-governmental representatives ensuring quality services and a very fine interweb, uh, internet web website was introduced to, to our team by uh, the, the group uh, organizing the center, which will provide uh, lots of useful information about the reintegration process. And in conclusion, uh, I will just draw attention to the fact that um, the foreign ministry um, uh, orders uh, uh, surveys every year so we can keep uh, abreast of what some of the needs and requirements are of our diaspora communities. Uh, much to the uh, similar to, to the Latvian experience, we were interested in finding out what would motivate uh, uh, migrants to, to return to Lithuania. So it, it isn't necessarily limited just to uh, economics. Uh, oftentimes, um, the respondents talk about a better psychological climate, you know, greater tolerance, respect for uh, the individual, respect in the workplace as strong motivating factors. And there's no doubt, as you can see uh, from uh, some of the statistics, that maintaining Lithuanian identity abroad is very important um, to, to immigrants. They place a lot of emphasis on, on Lithuanian language education and very much uh, value activities uh, sponsored by, by the embassy where they can keep in touch with Lithuanian culture, traditions, uh, commemorate state um, uh, anniversaries, and uh, in, in many ways uh, maintain uh, that connection with Lithuania. I will conclude with that slide. I can just say that the, the, the trends are very positive now. In Lithuania, we have uh, more uh, uh, migrants re re uh, returning to, to Lithuania each year. Uh, the situation is, is stabilizing and uh, th the main obviously um, reason for that is, is or the main motivation is uh, bettering uh, economic and, and social conditions in the country and the, the possibility to you know, realize themselves professionally and, and personally back in their home country. Thank you. I'll be glad to answer any questions should you have some. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. So, and our honor to have our last speaker, Mr. Ryman Sherry from, uh, from Malta, a highly specific country in the EU, I guess the smallest country uh, amongst the EU member states. And Mr. Sherry, is the diplomat, scientist, writer, artist. Very welcome. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to firstly thank the Latvian Presidency for this excellent initiative along with um, uh, the Europeans throughout the world. I think, uh, as I said and previously, it's a very important and a good beginning towards um, something much bigger for diaspora fairs on a European level. My presentation today is about linking Malta with its diaspora. Um, I've originally planned a very uh, different agenda than what I would like to um, focus mainly because I've seen the presentations previously on giving ideas 
to not only Lithuania but everybody else to share with you what what we are doing vis-à-vis uh, -vis our diaspora because I think that is uh, very important that we share the knowledge uh, with each other, best practices, uh, so we can improve the lives of our peoples everywhere. Um, I will go through the, the, uh, the agenda here. Um, basically, to give you a background for some people who might not know much about Malta, since we are a very tiny country, the smallest member state. Uh, Malta is uh, a group of uh, islands which are slightly larger than the city of, of uh, Riga. Um, so you could imagine how small it is. A population of about 425,000 people. Um, and it's one of the most densely populated countries in the world with 1,346 persons per kilometer. Uh, it's only Singapore and um, uh, Hong Kong which uh, beats Malta in, in, in population density. Um, tourism, financial services, and commercial services uh, are among a list of um, uh, minor and major sectors where Malta, uh, Malta's economy is based upon. Uh, it is uh, one of the most open and diversified economies uh, in Europe and um, has managed to weather a lot of crises and maintain very good and healthy statistics. Malta joined the EU in 2004 with the big wave of uh, countries. Um, uh, it is also one of the few, one of the eight countries in the Council of Europe who have more people outside the country than within the country itself. Malta is a very active uh, country on the international scene. Um, we've had major conferences, uh, especially uh, upcoming conference, uh, which is called Trogam, which is the uh, uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government uh, Conference, whereby the Commonwealth countries convene on Malta to meet um, uh, as a group. We're also looking forward towards uh, the EU presidency, our very first EU presidency, um, in 2000, the first half of 2017, and also 2018, uh, Valletta, which is the capital city, will be the European cultural capital. Um, Malta's diaspora around the world, um, I'll just go a bit further to look at these, uh, it's much easier to, to understand. Our major populations uh, for diaspora are found in Australia, United States, uh, Canada, UK, and also in Greece. Um, we've got also minor communities in a number of other, other countries. Obviously we call them the population of less than a thousand people. Um, and these are found in mainly the, the countries exhibited on the list there. Um, interesting enough, uh, the categories of our diaspora, uh, we divide the diaspora into the permanent diaspora, the people who decided to leave permanently the islands, and that, that they account for 92% of, of those people, and uh, you, you saw them on this, the first slide, where there's Australia, Canada, US, uh, UK, and the rest. We also have um, temporary diaspora, the people who decide to leave for a small, a short period of time, long period of time, depending on the purpose of their leaving. We also have uh, over 900 missionaries, mainly Catholic missionaries, and also um, a, a good number of volunteers who go and help them out in 173 countries around the world. Um, uh, we also have what's called the offshore diaspora, about 15,000 people who live, who work on oil, gas installations on offshore, on the sea. And we also have what's called tourism diaspora, are the people who are mainly the relatives of the diaspora who shuttle back and forth between countries to visit their relatives. So basically, just to go through very quickly, the um, uh, historic milestones of the Maltese diaspora. Um, the diaspora is first recorded in Maltese documents in the early 13th century, whereby in one of the deeds um, it specifically says that a family is migrating to somewhere. So that is our first indication that the uh, diaspora was, uh, was actually existed at that time. And um, during the 19th and 18th, uh, sorry, 19th and early 20th centuries, we had the first mass migration 
to a number of Mediterranean countries, mainly led by missionaries who went to sort of uh, deliver the religious message and carried along a crowd with them. Um, uh, after that, the, these uh, migrants uh, spread around the rest of the world, mainly uh, the US, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and other places. In the 1950s, Malta saw the largest wave uh, of migration, where one out of five Maltese left the country. Um, uh, and in 1969, um, obviously following this large wave and um, this sort of interest in the Osprey Fairs, um, the church took the first initiative in Malta to organize the first convention for Maltese living abroad. And at that time, that was uh, pretty um, revolutionary, uh, especially in the Mediterranean. There were no countries who really looked at the, the Osprey as an issue. Um, it's, it's more like a bread and butter survival issue at the time. But the church took that initiative and uh, subsequent um, uh, conventions took place um, all the way up to two weeks ago when we had the fourth convention for the Maltese living abroad, where we had over 100 delegates from uh, many countries visiting um, Malta to discuss uh, problems and issues. And the most recent um, developments were uh, the uh, changes in the citizenship laws where Malta uh, introduced dual nationality and then eventually introduced as well multiple nationality. Just to give you an example, uh, I was born in the United States from Maltese parents. My wife was born in Australia from Maltese parents. Um, our children have three citizenships besides European citizenship. So there is, I am a very common person in Malta where we have multiple citizenships. And we've been to many, many uh, places. And obviously it enriches um, uh, our background and also our possibilities. I think the most important milestone then is Act uh, 20 of 2011, establishing what's called the Council for the Maltese Living Abroad. And it is a very powerful council in terms of legislative background. It has the power to overrule um, uh, basically any idea which contradicts or goes against the interest of the Maltese diaspora in Parliament. It is also now entrenched in the constitution of the country, so it has also bigger teeth to bite. Um, and it's basically um, uh, a council which is the proposing body, proposes changes, laws, and ideas. And the directorate, which I, I run, is basically the implementation branch. These wishes are implemented through the directorate. Um, as I said, it has a very um, uh, good, solid um, legal framework. Um, uh, there is also the, uh, the tasks of the directorate, which are quite extensive, even though we're a staff of about uh, three, four people. <laughs> so we're not so, so large, but um, we managed to do a lot of work related to the diaspora. So just to go through them very quickly, um, the directorate basically assists in organizing all the events related to the diaspora in Mo the Maltese Islands, and also assists where possible um, uh, events organized abroad, um, uh, especially where the high commissions and embassies are involved. We are the, fo the information focal point for the Maltese government and also for other governments who are interested in knowing about the way the system works in Malta in assisting um, uh, the diaspora. We're in constant contact with um, stakeholders and stakeholders range from internal stakeholders all the way up to international stakeholders, such as ETTW, which I, I am uh, vice president as well of the organization and actively participate um, in this organization. Um, and the tasks go on. There's, there's plenty of tasks, um, which uh, even lecturing in, at university on the OSPRA issues, um, conducting research, I think the most important two points uh, which has made a big difference in recent years uh, are the uh, voluntary registration of Maltese living abroad. We have a form which is distributed everywhere. It could be found online and it could be filled out by any Maltese living anywhere in the world. And that way we can know 
where people are in cases of emergencies. We have a 24-hour uh, call center whereby if we know that there are Maltese in, in particular areas, we call local government officials or our diplomatic people on ground uh, to see if they need any help or any assistance. Um, just to give you an example, recently there were bushfires in New South Wales and Australia, and we had a number of uh, residents there. And within uh, an hour and a half, we managed to take them out of their house without them knowing that their house is going to be burned in a few uh, uh, minutes from the fires uh, from Malta, not from Australia. So it is quite helpful, uh, quite helpful exercise. We also have what's called a voluntary registration, again on the word voluntary because we cannot force anyone to register with us, uh, a register of prominent Maltese, people who have been successful in different areas uh, whereby we keep a register and wherever our country needs certain expertise which we don't have on the island, given our small population, uh, we can try to tap into the resources of Maltese living abroad. We understand that the 92% permanent diaspora will not be coming back to Malta anytime soon. So we devise a system whereby not just trying to attract them back, but also try to create what's called win-win situations. In other words, um, uh, basically, it, it would be beneficial for the Maltese living abroad and for the Maltese government or NGOs who are in Malta. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, we have a number of top surgeons in the UK who operate on very, very delicate uh, operations, which will cost millions for the Maltese government. Um, we've had several cases where we consulted our diaspora abroad and uh, saved millions for the country uh, instead of charging four or five million sterling for, for operations, for certain operations, um, uh, out of patriotism and out of love of, of the motherland, they would um, do the job at a much lower uh, rate or even free of charge. So there is a win-win situation. They get our recognition as their homeland, and in return, Malta also saves uh, a lot of money, which is... Um, uh, very important for us. Um, I'd like to focus my last part of the uh, presentation basically on one, another init other initiatives we're um, uh, working on. In terms of Maltese language, which is a very big, hot issue. By the way, we've got a language, even though we're a very tiny country. Um, it's a very ancient language. Um, and the uh, Maltese diaspora are very interested in maintaining this language. We've got 45 schools around the world, spread in Australia, Canada, UK, uh, United States, uh, Luxembourg, Belgium, and another of other countries. It's impossible for us to send teachers everywhere. So we devised a program online, uh, which is recognized by the EU system, by the Commonwealth system, and by the individual states where we have communities. And they could follow courses online, uh, even visual courses. And we have a 24-hour um, uh, call center, which we've based in Malta, uh, to answer um, exercises related to Maltese language, answer questions and problems, and also offer scholarships for the students who, who do very well. Um, that's one, one important step, I think, in trying to preserve the language, um, even given that Maltese integrate very well wherever they, they've settled. Um, another important, uh, I think, point is that we've created a program whereby uh, it's a homecoming program for the second to the fifth living generations um, who would like to visit Malta and explore their family history. By the way, Malta has uh, one of the oldest documents uh, after Vatican City in Europe. Uh, we can go back up to 27 generations, uh, recorded history, and we could immerse them into uh, the history of the village or town where their parents or grandparents originate from and create a scenario where this is how your grandparents or parents used to live before they left to Australia or to the US to make them aware that uh, Malta still 
um, treasures, the, 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 the heritage they've had left behind. And surprisingly enough, many young people decide to stay in Malta. You know, they, they decide to abandon the country they were born in and say, oh, Malta is my country now. So they return back. So it's one of the, the ways we, we attract them back. Um, these are just two examples of the programs we have. There are more, but unfortunately we don't have the time for it. Um, the last point I would like to um, emphasize, and I'll close with this, is the importance of recognizing an evolution of European diaspora policy. Um, uh, I believe this conference is a milestone uh, if we look back in history uh, in the future. Um, why? Because Europe is, is the only continent left on the planet who has not really cared specifically about diaspora in the sense that we've never gathered people from all countries discussing all the problems on a regular basis. The Africans meet regularly, they're going to meet next the end of this month in Malta to see how they can help the migration problem in the Mediterranean. Actually, we want to have representatives from basically most African countries who more to offer them the space to say, let's see what we can do as uh, governments to help our diasporas abroad, to help migrants uh, with the problems they have. Um, Chogham, which I've mentioned earlier, will have a specific workshop on diaspora affairs, uh, and that will take place in November. Another conference will be organized next month on the 28th of June, whereby um, uh, Malta will be hosting an international diaspora conference um, to further bring our consciousness uh, to the, to, to, to forth and to bring to light the problems diasporas face today anywhere, not just in Europe. Um, but I appeal to governments to not only consider this, uh, the, the fact of organizing some sort of a meeting, a convention of Europeans living abroad, and not just Europeans living within European borders, because we have more Europeans living outside European borders than within our borders. And these are not second-class citizens. They are first-class citizens like everybody else. Um, uh, the last uh, point I would like to mention is that Malta looks forward to work with member states on this issue in light of Malta's first presidency in the beginning of 2017. And we hope that these issues are brought forth in order to ensure that the difficulties and the sufferings of many Europeans are as much as possible alleviated and solutions are found to these problems and not ending up in the court of justice in Europe with such a, a, num a large number of caseload uh, relating to uh, diaspora issues. That's not the way forward. The way forward is to sit down around a large table, having the European family all together, discussing these issues, bringing them out, and finding solutions for these uh, problems. And this I would like to congratulate as well ETDW for its sterling work in trying to bring uh, to light these problems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation and for keeping time. So as planned, we have enough time for discussion. I think we heard a very, very rich presentations, all four presentations, and I want to open the floor for discussions any questions, comments that you have? And I see already hands here in front, and then Jonathan, and then all the rest. <laughs> right, and then in front. Okay. Thank you. My name is Dorin. I'm uh, representing the Romanian uh, the community in, uh, in Belgium. Um, I want to thank the, the panel. Very interesting presentations for today. Uh, as you probably know, Romania is one of the countries that is also hit by this drain of the people issue. More than 15% of the population works abroad. It's about 3 million people. Some of the 
the people said that it's one of the worst impact after the second war. So we lost a lot of people, much more than on the second war. So my question is, uh, is for all, the, all of you. Um, I've seen the initiatives that you have in place for helping the people to return back to your own countries. I'd like to know if you may have any measurable results on, on uh, these initiatives. I mean, if you could really see some returning, real returning rates of the people living abroad from your own, uh, own countries. As well, um, sorry, I put it here not to forget. Um, if you have any proactive programs instead of reactives, I mean, we, right now we face a problem, Latvia, Romania, Lithuania, and Malta, everybody, I think, um, on the east side of the Europe. Did you notice or are you aware of any proactive programs to prevent the brain drain out of your countries? And maybe one suggestion from uh, what, we, what we've done in Romania as well, and might be interesting to share with you. Uh, we've noticed that a lot of the Romanians living abroad are unlikely to return back unless, you know, they have a decent job. And one of the area that I think is very interesting for them is the entrepreneurship. So we basically constituted a club, like a business club, where the um, people who actually returned home in Romania, they were living abroad and opening, opened a business in Romania recently. They have these success stories and they are actually mentoring the newcomers to return back and to open businesses. We observed that it's the return rate of the people to, which actually will come back to Romania to have a regular job, it's very low. You know, they are not accepting, I mean, after, I mean, I'm just imagining, you know, a Latvian working in UK, it's unlikely that he'll return back home and to really go and take a regular job for a few hundred euros, right? So um, we look at these directions as well to develop their entrepreneurship ideas and to try to make them entrepreneurs because they have very good skills, very good experience that they actually gather abroad. And I think it's one of the great opportunities for them to really develop in their own countries. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for your question. I, I think we could, we could answer now and then we will go with the other question. So who would like to start? Then maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, you've mentioned quite a number of uh, issues. Uh, first of all, I think we, s we need to see this in light of um, a reality which is not really spoken about much in European terms. When ETTW mentions 80 million Europeans living abroad, and I think the number is far greater than 80 million, uh, we're talking about the largest member state of the EU. Uh, all right, the physically it doesn't exist as a land, but obviously it's made out of people, and uh, people are the most important thing uh, for us in Europe because we have freedom of movement of persons, etc. Um, so I think we need to see it from that standpoint of view. Many countries uh, have situations where their diaspora might decide to return back. Our country is a bit different, we know they're not going to come back in large numbers. So we try to use technology to keep in touch with them, to tap on their resources, and we ta they tap on our cooperation and our resources, and we work that way. Obviously, we try to offer incentives that they come over to Malta. Uh, the doors are always open, and there are also incentives for them to return back. For example, they can bring over their cars, vehicles, duty-free. Their children can attend any level of education free of charge, primary, secondary, university, all the way. So there are plenty of incentives for Maltese to return back to Malta. But they decide, obviously, to remain in the country uh, they've, they've went, decided to live in. 
We've had a number of successes in terms of business successes in Malta, but the biggest successes are our ability to identify the people who've made, who have been successful abroad and help our country in terms of investment, know-how, expertise, and also forward planning. I think that, honestly speaking, I don't, I don't think they need to return back to the country uh, if they don't want to. If it's possible, yes, that's better. And if that's, if that's what you like, that's even better. But still, um, they are to be left free to do whatever they want to, and they could still contribute to the country greatly. Um, uh, so that is the point I would like to, to make. Uh, I think a lot of our programs have been quite successful, um, uh, a bit different from the programs of other countries that I've heard here and in the previous days in the conference. Yes. I think I could agree word for word with what my uh, Maltese colleague said. Um, in terms of proactive uh, approaches, I think just bettering the economic and social conditions in the country and addressing uh, some of the, the questions that have ar arised uh, in uh, the, the public uh, opinion polls that we've come up, uh, conducted um, through professional pollsters um, with the diaspora communities uh, need to be addressed. Um, uh, bettering the psychological climate in the country, having more respect in, in the workplace. These are all uh, factors that are, you know, come up year after year in, um, in these uh, public uh, opinion polls. And, and from the numbers, we can see that now uh, many more uh, immigrants are returning, particularly uh, young professionals. Uh, for instance, the conditions for establishing uh, a business in Lithuania, uh, you know, is, is, is very good uh, among, uh, you know, the best in, in, in Europe. So you have many success stories of, you know, young professionals coming back, establishing businesses and doing very well in Lithuania. I would say the uh, information climate in Lithuania has changed over the past uh, few years, uh, quite remarkably. Um, there's a much more positive image and much more positive reporting about these uh, specific uh, instances. Um, so there's, there's much more uh, public acceptance and, and approval of, of you know, di diaspora involvement in the life of Lithuania. You see more representatives of, of the diaspora you know, taking part in governing councils of different bodies of Lithuania. For instance, I mentioned one of the implementing agencies of the Global Lithuania Program is the Ministry of Education and its daughter organization, uh, Lithuanian uh, Science Foundation. There's a very strong uh, collection of academic scientists that uh, play strong advisory roles mm -hmm. in, the, in the work of, of this particular body. So you, you see that becoming a much more stronger trend in Lithuania. I, I, I probably do not have much statistics to, to quote from the French uh, angle, but what I would like to point out to is the difficulty that we face sometimes to return home from a legal standpoint. And I have a few examples affecting my country, but other countries also in the constituency that I represent in the French parliament. Uh, returning home means uh, obtaining very often the recognition of academic diploma and professional experience. And that doesn't come easily. Mm -hmm. uh, it creates also a series of issues relating to social security, uh, relating to the assessment, for instance, of disability. Not too long ago, I was trying to help out a compatriot who lives in Austria who wanted to return to Paris to join the Foreign Service. And he was denied the right to join the Foreign Service because his disability had been assessed by Austria, not by France. These are concrete examples of difficulties faced by people willing to return home. And the last example I want to give, and that, that is a very unfortunate uh, situation that we find increasingly uh, in Europe, uh, family law could be an obstacle. Uh, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to divorce, when it comes to custody of the children. These are very concrete issues that we need to address 
as uh, diaspora representatives, expatriates, in order to facilitate the return of people that want to go home uh, in Europe and, and beyond Europe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, um, I certainly agree uh, that um, uh, with the idea that was voiced by I think everyone here, that the, uh, the return migrants, people who have lived abroad, can really become a source of positive change in these societies uh, because they come with, with new ideas. They've, they've seen how things might work differently. Uh, I've lived abroad for some time as well, and you just notice things, for example, that are not in your country and maybe would work better in your country. And you have these, these like, full head of ideas. And then it's important that, that you have some support uh, if you want, for example, to open a new business or, uh, or to start your own company and things like that. And that's why, for example, one of the ideas that were, raised, were, were voiced by uh, the um, uh, respondents in our survey was that they would like to have some, some, some for example, uh, some... Um, easier access to, to loans, for example, uh, which is not that easy sometimes for if, if you've worked abroad, so you can't really prove your income that easily, um, and things like that. Uh, as of measurable data, um, of course, we, uh, we do measure in surveys also, for example, I don't know, like uh, attachment to the country and, and language skills, and, and, uh, uh, and we can also measure how many have attended the language classes and, 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 and um, um, and then and diaspora uh, camps and things like that. Um, and also, um, that's why also, for example, in the survey with, with the link longitudinal design, we have also, we are also intending to, to follow how these things develop uh, uh, with time. For example, do people become more attached or less, less attached to the country? Do, they, do more people plan to come back or maybe have come back already? Uh, because actually at the moment, it's very hard to, to get any precise data on how many people have returned to Latvia. Uh, because like, the majority of migration, of emigration, is to other EU countries. And at least in Latvia, people do not really feel that they, that they have to register. In many cases, for example, when they go, go abroad, they don't even know for how long they will stay there. Maybe they think, I'll stay there, you know, just for a year. Uh, just, you know, uh, to to study, to, 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 you know, to, to visit, whatever. And then it turns out that, that the person stays longer. Um, so situations are very, 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 very different. Um, and there is this really the problem with registering your place of residence. So we don't know for sure, for example, it, that, that's why there are so many discussions between, between researchers, how many actually live abroad and how many have returned. Um, uh, what is also a difficulty is that we know uh, that many people who come back, who return, uh, they, uh, they go, go, go abroad again. For example, uh, in our survey, 40% um, of diaspora members have left Latvia more than once. Yeah? Uh, it's, uh, what it means is that even if you manage to attract that person back, it doesn't mean that the person will stay. Uh, because nowadays, uh, both the identities and the lifestyles be uh, very often become transnational. There are also people who work, for example, simul simultaneously in several countries. Uh, they travel a lot between countries. Uh, for example, there's, uh, we found that there's 17% of our uh, diaspora members who, who say that they live both in Latvia and abroad. Right? So it's not that the, the person maybe have, has two homes, one in Latvia and then, I don't know, in Germany or in UK. Right? It's not the way we've used to think about migration. It's not a one-directional di uh, one process. Uh, and it's not uh, that the person is necessarily tied only to one country. Um, uh, what I also wanted to say is that there's one particular area where we uh, specifically lack data currently, and that is about the situation of those who have returned. How are they actually doing? Uh, and I know that, for example, now there's a large-scale survey taking place, like a comparative survey, and uh, it's called STYLE, in like an ac acronym, and, and uh, Estonia is included, and they specifically will be focusing, for example, on, on the labor market outcomes for those who have returned and how they're actually doing. So I think this, this is something that, is, that would be very interesting to study in the future. Uh, and also, if we know that quite a few people return again, uh, they leave again, uh, to try to understand why they leave again, right? What are the reasons? If they made the decision to come back, why did they leave again, right? So this, this is something, I think, to focus on in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we move ahead, and there is a question in front, and then... Hi, my name is Sami. I'm from New European. I'm the vice chair. We support the community in the UK. Um, 
I wanted to talk about engagement, and I was wondering whether we could get inspired from the French model, which works very well. And I'm not saying this because I'm a French national, but they have a um, good way of keeping um, us engaged with French politics. And actually, it's one of the rare countries that have um, representative in the parliament. Now, if we're talking about engaging, keeping ties with the diaspora, shouldn't we have, in all EU countries, representative in assemblies, in national assemblies? Because if you're saying that this community matters, somebody needs to represent their interests. And we have different interests than other, um, you know, our citizens who live in, in, in our country. The other part, uh, we work in the community, we do a lot of outreach work, a lot of EU citizens fall off the system and they don't really understand what sort of services are, are, are available. And we as an organization working on the ground, we don't know about all the support systems that you have in place. Uh, we've had Lithuanian nationals who lost, he lost his job, he lost his house, he felt depressed, he was in a psychiatric ward. Had we known all these support services, we could have engaged with yourself. So I was wondering whether you could take this engagement further by engaging in those countries with organizations that help your citizens so that you can reach them. Because we have an information deficiency. We don't know what's out there. So when they come to us and they don't come straight to you, it'd be good for us to know, well, you can go to your consulate and these are the sort of services that you can get. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a very, very great uh, comment. And is there any response, or we could probably move ahead? Or would, would you? Yes, yes, please, please go ahead. Very briefly, um, uh, representation. Again, countries are very different in, in the area of diaspora. Uh, you keep in mind that there are eight countries in the Council of Europe who have more citizens abroad than have in their own country. Now, in order to have representation in Parliament, and given the Maltese scenario, where 1,500 votes can switch governments, mm -hmm. let alone a million and a half Maltese living abroad, that means that any future governments in Malta will be determined by Maltese living abroad who do not pay taxes, who do not have, um, most of them don't even have uh, property or even relatives in the country. So it's going to be very difficult for us to have representation in Parliament. And it is agreed in a survey uh, amongst uh, a, a good scientific number of Maltese that they would agree with the situation that they will never have representatives in Maltese Parliament or vote at a national election. European election, yes. Local election, yes. Uh, probably president, presidential election, yes, but not that uh, determines a government, because obviously you're going to have a government elected from outside the country. You might disagree with me, I understand, but even the diaspora itself agrees with the situation in the case of Malta. It might be different in all other cases. Now on outreach, um, we have programs for the elderly who have major problems and elderly and disability people, the young people and people who uh, are unemployed in our diaspora. We offer bulletins of job opportunities in Malta for these people, free training if they come to Malta and assistance in settling in Malta if they're out of a job and would like to have uh, work, come back home and work in Malta. The same thing with old people. If you haven't visited the country for a certain period of time, and some people haven't visited for 30, 40, even 50 years, they just left and, and uh, would like to come back, they are given a very discounted rate so they can come, especially from Australia, which is a very costly operation to come over from Australia. It's very expensive for them, given the wage level in Australia as well. Um, uh, so basically, uh, the, there are these programs for outreaching for the minorities, the vulnerable people, um, uh, and also the people that might need that extra hand to get out of their situation. Right. How do we know? How do we know about 
Well, the Maltese uh, abroad are represented by the councillors on the Council for the Maltese Living Abroad. Each councillor has a territory similar to the French system, but obviously they're not elected. They are appointed, elected from the community itself. Um, and they represent a territory, a part of the world, whereby it's their responsibility to inform the Maltese diaspora in their particular areas. Organize seminars, they've got obviously the website. Um, there's the Maltese embassies, high commissions, consul generals, honorary consuls in different parts of the world. So they together work together to get the message across that these services are available for them. Right. If I could just re respond to the, the concrete example that you gave, I think you know the first point of contact obviously would be the, the embassy, the nearest consulate, um, or if there isn't a, a, a nearest consulate in that particular uh, country or area, we also have a, a wide network of honorary consuls. All the contact information can be found on the foreign ministry website. There's an excellent uh, consular um, information uh, site where uh, it's interactive and, and provides uh, very basic information in, in mul multiple languages. And also, uh, there's a, a number that works 24 hours a day where, you know, Lithuanian citizens in trouble can contact and be extended these, these basic services. Maybe I should add that in response to the second part of your question, that each of our respective countries have systems in place to support their compatriots in need. Uh, what we lack at this stage is a common platform where we could easily identify what the others have and maybe mutualize some of the elements that we have. Uh, we miss that, and that's too bad. And as a consequence, very often we cannot unite at least enough uh, to seek a common solution at European level. I took the example of disability. It's a good one. Disability is an area where EU law hasn't been yet totally completed. There is much that we should do if altogether expats, we could step beyond our respective national organizations and unite as a front, even conduct lobby activities so that we could find another element of support for the expat communities. Uh, another element that I would like to, to, to emphasize is that living abroad is not necessarily a loss to the country. Mm -hmm. It brings a lot back to the country. We're all respectively ambassadors of our countries where we live. And uh, I do not judge my compatriots on the decision they make to live abroad or return home or stay abroad. They are Frenchmen. And I, I have to represent them in the French Parliament the same way another person living in my hometown of Quimper and Finisterre would represent people living in Finisterre. They are French citizens. We are not less of citizens by living abroad. And that is also an element that we should maybe focus uh, more on as we move forward. Right. Yeah, well, um, uh, I can only agree with what was said before. Uh, what, I just, what I wanted to add is that I think it's important that the immigrants themselves are provided with more information about, for example, specific risks uh, that are out there. Uh, for example, sometimes we hear about some unpleasant cases of uh, that people have been taking their passports away or that, you know, being forced to marry someone or, I don't know, also the employment situations, for example, right? And, and so these things very often happen just because people do not really uh, recognize the risks enough or, or, you know, things like that. So, so, so information, providing information to migrants themselves, I think is also crucial, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go ahead, and there is a question. Thank you, uh, Jonathan Shala from the OECD. I had a question. Uh, thanks very much for the first presentation, Inta. Uh, I think it's uh, important to look at some of the questions that keep people from coming back, and uh, in light also of the speakers who followed. Uh, I wonder if you can answer the question of how much support there is in the country for these kinds of initiatives. Some of the, what it would take to bring people back is expensive. I mean, it seems that uh, there's a lot of resources required, not just the economic development in the origin country, but also uh, actual providing services, uh, providing favorable treatment in the tax system, as you said. Uh, why should nationals support their 
there, there are fellows who've gone abroad, who've, who've left the country, who haven't paid taxes. Why should there be more favorable conditions? How do you uh, build support for that? It's, I think it might be fairly straightforward to work with diaspora associations. It's not very expensive. It's not very controversial. But when you start to actually invest in an infrastructure or in services for immigrants, how do you build support for that in the origin country, and how do you justify it? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for the question. I think uh, this, this is a question that comes up quite often uh, because in our society uh, there is really this, some, sometimes this is what we hear like why would, why would the immigrants uh, get a better treatment than our own people uh, who are paying taxes and who have stayed here and fought through the, you know, through the hard times whereas the others have left and now they'll be receiving specific, specific, you know, special treatment. On the other hand, what I believe and what I think can be easily justified is that uh, there are objective, uh, uh, objective uh, advantages, for example, uh, to bringing back people with, for example, a foreign education, with a foreign experience, because it is different. It brings something new, something different in our economy, right? So from that point of view, I think at least some spe special support can be, can be justified and would be advisable, I would say. Uh, on the other hand, of course, we have to keep in mind also uh, the fact that we have to be fair towards the people who, ha who live here and who have stayed here. And, and, and so that is always a balance, right? On the other hand, what we were also discussing today um, um, uh, before, before the session was that, like, for example, if you talk about subsidized employment, right? Uh, if, if, if our um, government is supporting, uh, like, is, is paying, for example, supporting employers in employing uh, young people or people in a pre-pension age or specific groups of society, why not, why not return migrants? Right? For example, if, if, they, if, 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 if they could pay like half of the, like part of the salary, for example, for return migrants, for example, for the first year or something like that, right? Um, again, you know, that's, there, there are some ways and some things that can be done besides uh, just, I don't know, giving some extra money to the return migrants that would be seen as a controversial thing, obviously, right? Uh, so this is a very sensitive issue, but I think there are some things that can be done uh, for sure, but, we, but, but, but obviously it's, it, it has to be considered, it has to be outweighed every time when some decisions are made because the society is very sensitive in that. Monsieur Le Bon. I, I remember during my, my electoral campaign four years ago, uh, I sort of tried to find out what was the amount of uh, tax returns that came one way or another from uh, the expat community and on the other hand uh, the expenses that were induced by the French government to, to promote policies to support these expats. And to the best of my surprise actually we collected on, on expats as much, pretty much, as uh, we were spending on expats. So it, it is not a huge uh, uh, element of expense for the French government to support. Uh, people living abroad and how do we do it very often through consulates and policies especially when it comes to scholarships for people studying in the lycée francais why do we do it because we believe that we we have a global mission and the same could be true for all the other countries to promote life abroad we do not live on respective islands the world is global and by pushing people to go abroad and you know, acquire an experience while building a global citizenship that serves the interest of the country, especially economic interest when it comes to winning markets, for instance. And, and for that purpose, it makes sense uh, to, to induce expenses to support communities living abroad and to help them return if they want to return. If I can add one more thing, I think that's important. Um, uh, uh, well, currently, obviously, we, uh, um, the unemployment rates are quite high and, and there's not a lack, lack of labor force. But we will come to a situation again, similar to what it was in 2006 and 2007, that we will not have enough labor force here in Latvia, obviously. So um, uh, there are, we have to recognize that there are alternatives, right? We can bring in people from some other countries. And, and for example, uh, uh, the experience shows that, uh, well, usually, in case of Latvia, these are usually people from Ukraine, Moldova, and, and, and that part of the world. Uh, or, or, we can try, uh, or we can try consciously to try to bring back our own people who have left, right? So that is kind of, that, that is a trend. The thing is that our society, also what we see from the surveys, is not very willing and open to accept people 
uh, like workers from other countries. So from that point of view, I think it would be easier to get support to bring back our own people. Isn't it true? <laughs> we have time for one very short question. And there is one short question. Please go ahead. And short answers, please. My name is Maris Pulis. I'm from the European Latvian Association based in the UK. Uh, we in Latvia uh, have this saying that all Latvians belong to Latvia. And I applaud that and the amount of work that some people do for the diaspora is absolutely superb. However, the survey did show uh, that about 60 to 70 percent felt that the government really did not, uh, did not really help the diaspora or did not understand what the diaspora is. And listening today from the panel, superb stuff, because you were talking about engagement and having a say. And I think that this is something that we should take on board as well in Latvia, either looking at national assemblies or having somebody that can represent the diaspora in politics and so on. So mostly it's just a comment and just a big thank you to the panel for the ideas that you've come up with today. Thank you. Would you? Or, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just uh, I just wanted to say that um, uh, uh, it's uh, I think it's 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 also uh, what many people mentioned here that it's very important to uh, to have the voices of the uh, voices of the diaspora heard, and I think it's more and more often that we really build on the survey data, on interviews with the migrants themselves. We try to get some feedback on how the policies have worked, on do they like it or not, do they see some other possibilities. So I, th so I think in that way. Uh, our 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 uh, attitudes are and, 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 and the policy development is changing as well, uh, which, in which is I think a very positive change. Mm -hmm. Like for example, now in Latvia, this new diaspora center is is, is, is formed. So I think uh, research and and, and, and and listening to diaspora will only develop in the future. Walter? Yes, one one very last short thing. Um, I would like to as well applaud the recommendations that were presented in front of us in this conference. Um, me and a number of our colleagues added some other recommendations to that document. I think the most two important things that need to be done urgently are the platform that our colleague from France mentioned. There needs to be a common plat European platform where these problems and issues are placed, um, not for sacrifice, but for finding um, solution for these problems and trying to improve the lives of um, uh, our fellow country people um, abroad. Um, and I think, uh, finally, the member states in the Union who have not uh, created uh, the administrative structure within their governments to deal with the OSPRA issues, please do consider that these people do need assistance from the home country and uh, a diaspora administrative stru structure within the government is essential to um, keep the link between your country and your diaspora abroad. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Our time has come to close and we really have to finish this fascinating, fascinating discussion. And thank you so much for inspiring presentations, very evocative and very intellectually inspiring. And of course, the uneasy relationships between the residents and the citizenship, they are still on table in a globalizing world and we have to address them step by step. And, and it is a mark, this conference is a mark as a beginning of a very high level intellectual, inspiring, evocative discussion towards the comprehensive diaspora policy in the EU. Once again, let's thank our speakers with the applause.